It's time to set aside the superficial. It's time to go deeper. It's time to engage in truth. Here's John Bornstein. Well, everybody, welcome back to Engage in Truth. This is John Bornstein. I'm the senior pastor of Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley right here in Colorado Springs. And I'm so excited that you are tuning in because we are continuing our study of the book of 1 Corinthians. And we are in chapter 3 today, picking up from last week where we read from verses 9 to 13. We're going to pick up now in verse 14, hopefully cover all the way through verse 17 today. I know, three verses, and yet it's filled with such depth and rich content that is applicable to our lives today. And so I know that you're about to be blessed. If you missed the prior studies, please feel free to go to Calvary Fountain. Dot com and you can listen to the prior broadcast as well as watch the sermons and, and get involved. We'd love to go deeper in the Word with you. And again, this is a ministry of Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley. So let's pick up where we left off in, in verse 14 here. So if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. Now, what does on it mean? If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a award. Well, last week, we talked about that foundation being Jesus Christ, that this is about laying a foundation for God's church. And anything built on that foundation must be with materials that are imperishable, the things of God, the things that he finds of great value. And so last week, we talked about preparing today for tomorrow and building on the foundation of Jesus Christ. We often find there are, that our identity with how we relate to church is by the building. We look to the exterior of the campus. We look to how many buildings and how big the building is and ultimately how many people are in that building. That seems to be the current modern interpretation of the metrics of success for a church. And that's not the building materials that God uses. His is about service and works that transform lives and ultimately build his kingdom and not ours. And about putting lives into the new Jerusalem that new people would walk the street of gold forever and ever. And how we go about our lives in service as the continuation of the incarnation here on this earth. As Jesus Christ left us with a responsibility to do, we continue in the work that he did. And he said, we'll do even greater things, but it's all about to his glory, ultimately, that God the Father would be glorified. Since God is a just and gracious God, he will ensure that each builder receives his or her due. And now these rewards will allow us then to experience God more intimately and reflect his glory more effectively. So he is not one who tells all of his labors to just labor. He he wants to reward the faithful laborers. And these rewards then allow us to experience God more intimately, reflect his glory, and, I, and it's amazing how this works as you go to Daniel chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians 15, even Revelation 4 on this. But then we have to ask that question, so what is God looking for ultimately? We're not rewarded for our success. We're rewarded for our faithfulness. So is your life characterized by labor and faithfulness? If so, you will receive a reward. So we often think in this culture that our measure of success is a bar that has been set. And if we perform to that level and yield a certain harvest through a reaping of a large harvest or whatever that might be, that that's the standard that has been set. We must have a a harvest from our labors. Rather, what we see here is that God is faithful to reward the laborer. He's the one that is ultimately responsible for planting and for watering, and for reaping that harvest. That's what we talked about a couple weeks ago. So again, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to that study to be reminded of the fact that anything good that comes out of us is to his glory. It's from him anyway. He's the one who does the watering, the planting, and the reaping. We are simply the obedient doulos for the king of kings. And so the Bible is clear that God will reward us for, number one, our deeds— Matthew 16, 27, Romans 2, 6, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, amongst many others, even James 1, 22 to 25. He then rewards us for our words. I know we actually will be rewarded for how we use our words even. Matthew 12, 36 to 37, James 3, 1 to 12. He'll even reward us for our motives, according to Matthew 6, 1 to 4, 1 Corinthians 4, 4 to 5. 
amongst many others, including Colossians 3, 23 to 24. Now, I say that so that way I hold myself accountable. I like to always cite Scripture before I say anything out of turn, because what we do here is we teach God's Word requires great precision. So you hear me cite a number of verses. But Christ addresses the motives of our hearts when we serve Him. Okay, so, so often we have an agenda or we think that we're somehow acquiring our salvation through our labors and perhaps positioning ourselves as higher than others by our labors. I mean, we see this even with the disciples, the, the mother of James and John, as she wanted her son's position to Jesus' left and right. It's in our nature to want to jockey for position before the eyes of the Father. And that's not what we're talking about here. In fact, let me take you to Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. He says, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have the reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be done in secret, and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly." So let the rewarding come from God the Father. Don't seek the accolades of man. And go back to Matthew 6, 1 to 4 on that. So as our perfect judge, he will take all of these areas into consideration and render a just verdict. Now, personally, I don't think I will ever be asked by God, how many people did you preach to on a Sunday? No, I, I think he's going to ask, how faithful were you with my word? Did you preach in the power of the Spirit rather than your own power and intellect? Did you live at home what you preached at church? Did you honor my name in your business? Did you teach your children the truths of God's Word? Did you love your spouse as Christ loves the church? None of these things involve official positions in the church, but they are nevertheless critical issues in building the church. Now let's look to verse 15 of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as though is through fire. Now this this appears that call uh, that Paul is really addressing the fact there that we could have our work burned up. Okay, so the result is that such a person will suffer loss. Everything that they put their efforts into will be lost. And so what he's talking about is they have suffered mightily in their hearts as they are standing before the beam of seat of Christ because everything of their labors and efforts in this world was for building their kingdom and not his. So this term of suffering loss appears 12 times in the scripture, Exodus 21 even, uh, verse 22, Deuteronomy 22, 19, Proverbs 17, 26, amongst many others. And this term can be either suffer damage, loss, or forfeit, or even to experience punishment. So this loss may be diminished praise, which I don't know about you, but I don't want to stand before the Lord and, and have him disappointed that he gave me so much time and life and resources and efforts and ability to get his work done. And, and I squandered it on my own aspirations and dreams and visions and my own hierarchy of needs. No, I'm supposed to be pouring that into his great work, building his kingdom and not for my own glory at all. I'm not looking for an attaboy. Really, what we are to do then is to do this holy and agape love to the one who first agape loved us. So contextually, it appears that the individual it was potentially guilty of partiality and disunity, perhaps even human wisdom or human evaluation of their calling. And this is a warning then. To, to those who are wise in their own eyes, those who boast in their human efforts. And this doesn't mean, doesn't mean that the person was fleshly or carnal in every area of, of their life, which would be in opposition to what we read in Romans chapter 6, since we are dead to sin. It's possible that they excelled in areas of individual holiness, yet failed miserably in their ministry or corporate service. And so again, we're talking about what builds God's church as Christ is the head of his church. And each of us have a responsibility, a role to play. As we get later into 1 Corinthians, we're going to see that of what it means to be the active body of Christ, not just by title or label alone, but a body that moves, a body that serves, a body that's in action 
for Jesus Christ. So Paul's concern here seems to be a wasted life of corporate service. We often really diminish or downplay our role within the church. We think we're just to be active listeners, that we warm a seat in the church. That, that's not what we're to do. In fact, we're, we all have a gift by the Holy Spirit, and, and I will teach on that later here in the study of 1 Corinthians and understanding what those gifts are and how they're to be used. And Ephesians 4 tells us that we equip the saints for the work of ministry, not for the work of warming pews, right? So yes, there is a time to learn. There is a time to worship. There is a time to pray and to do so corporately, but there's also an expectation that with these ingredients comes transformation of the mind and also ultimately a transformation of our life and service before Jesus Christ. It's a byproduct of a transformed mind. So Christian service that has no lasting value is like eating junk food. You and I don't want to present a life full of spiritual junk food to Christ because it's going to go into the flames. That's where it's headed. We want to present him with a life of sincere, quality service that will survive the test and will yield a reward. But it's not for the reward that we labor. That that is a gift from Almighty God to us, His choice to do. But if we're doing it for the reward, we've missed the point. So if this life offers you so much that you're willing to sacrifice the blessing of your next life, then you don't have your eyes on the prize. And we're going to discuss that more when we read 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So Paul concludes this section with this statement, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So the Corinthian believer who builds poorly will suffer the loss of his or her work and potential reward but will be eternally saved. Yes, they're still a child of God, not because of their labors, but because of Jesus Christ and his great work. This is part of the justification process. You're justified, then you're sanctified, and then you are glorified. So the justifying is done wholly by Jesus Christ. The sanctification process, we're, we're refined by fire, if you will. First Peter, he tells us this is the refiner's fire. And, and this is important to understand the sanctification process. And during this process, we are, we are we'll conform to the image of Christ. The impurities removed. We go through trial and tribulation. This is why 2 Corinthians is so important to understand. And this he says, as through fire. And this is an idiom meaning to escape with difficulty, to have a narrow escape. And so in this sanctification process, we see here a believer that chose to build their kingdom and not God's kingdom. And therefore they suffer great loss and they basically escape because of the propitiation of Jesus Christ. If not for his atonement over them, because they confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord, believed in their heart that God raised them from the dead, but yet their life had no fruit from that. And that's not possible because if we are truly of Christ, in Christ, he is the vine, we are the branches, so we are to yield fruit in some way. If it's real, if we're abiding with Christ, something should come out of it. So this phrase has become a metaphor like, you were like a firebrand, plucked from the burning, as we see as Amos chapter 4, verse 11, comparing to being saved by someone else and not of your own efforts. And that is true of Jesus Christ. So this further demonstrates the solemn nature of the judgment seat of Christ. And so perhaps this analogy will help you understand how the Bema seat of Christ will place will be a place of either joy or ultimately even regret for some Christians. And let me use this illustration. Maybe this will help a little bit. Imagine that your insurance agent said, I've been reviewing your homeowner's policy and believe you are underinsured by $150,000. I'd recommend that you increase your coverage. But suppose you said, well, let me think about it and I'll get back to you in a few weeks. And that very night, you're awakened by the smell of smoke, hearing the screams of your children. You stumble through the thick fog until you reach their bedrooms, grabbing your children. You grope through the darkness, searching for a way out. But all of the exits are blocked, so you throw a chair through the window, climb through the broken glass. Once safely outside, you watch in horror and disbelief as your home is consumed by flames. What emotions do you feel at that moment? Certainly you're not relieved. I mean, I guess you could say certainly you're relieved that your family is safe, but you're really not relieved at the end of the day that you simply just escaped the fire. You could have 
done more. And so nevertheless, you, you feel this deep sense of regret as you consider the financial loss that you're about to experience. The insurance agent warns you, you did not heed that warning. And so now your joy of survival is now tempered by these feelings of regret. Yes, your family is safe. Yes, you've escaped fiery destruction, but you could have done so much more and you could have actually tapered any regrets in that particular situation with a sense of joy and relief saying, yeah, I heeded the, I heeded the warning. The family's going to be okay. We're going to be okay. And ultimately, that's what the Bible is filled with, of warnings of saying, don't be complacent. Don't sit on the sideline. Don't simply just leverage all that Christ has done when he was the propitiation of your sins and continues to hold firm upon you. It is by his grip that he holds on to us, according to John chapter 10, not our grip holding on to him. But do we take that, that gift, that amazing grace of salvation and squander it? Or do we use it for his kingdom as we ought to, according to 1 John? So it does not appear that the loss concerns every area of this believer's life. It, Jesus said, and whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of the disciple, assuredly, I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward, according to Matthew 10, 42. So like a loving father, Jesus appears to be gracious and generous with rewards for his children, despite themselves at times. So it, it seems improbable that a member of the Corinthian church was building off on the foundation with what would be without a single work in any area of their life. I mean, clearly as believers, there probably was a moment in which they were serving the Lord in some capacity. Maybe they weren't even cognizant of it. And since the Lord takes accurate records of all, he is gracious despite ourselves, even to reward the things that we maybe uh, didn't really think much of. And you planted a seed and didn't realize how it germinated, how God watered that, and how it reaped a big harvest because of your obedience. So the Lord is the one who keeps an accurate record of these things. You see, my children, I think they're brilliant in my humble opinion, okay? And it's just a dad speaking from the heart. I, I'm sure you think your child is too. So as parents, we have high expectations of our children when they stand before the entire school at the awards ceremony. We love hearing our child's name be called out. But there isn't as much satisfaction for a parent if the only reward they come home with is the attendance award. We know that they could have done so much better than that, and we want them to give it their all and get those math and science and history and language awards, even the gold honor roll awards. Now, there are those children who give it their all, and they still are not recognized before men, but you see, our Heavenly Father sees all. He rewards on effort and motive, i.e. faithfulness and not fruitfulness, because he's the one who brings the fruit, not you. So our job is to be faithful in service, and God is responsible for the results. So you see, my desire is for you to realize that the time to prepare for tomorrow is today. The great reformer Martin Luther from 1483 to 1546, he's quoted as saying, there are two days on my calendar, today and that day. If we live like that, we can prepare for our eternal home. So let's examine these final two verses if we can within our final minutes together. But let me start off with yet another illustration before we look at these final verses. In 1889, there was a, a most unusual structure that was built. When it was first built for an international exhibition, the citizens of the city called the structure monstrous, and they demanded it be torn down as soon as the exhibition was over. And yet from the moment its architect first conceived it, he took pride in it and loyally defended it from those who wished to destroy it. He knew it was destined for greatness. And today, it's one of the architectural wonders of the modern world and still stands as a primary landmark. Where? In Paris, France. And the architect it built this incredible structure that's today known as the Eiffel Tower. So here, the people didn't understand its value, certainly thought it was an eyesore at that time, only now to embrace it and understand its great value that they didn't see right away. And in the same way, we ought to be struck by Jesus Christ's loyalty to another structure, the church. 
We often overlook it. We don't value it like we should. We think of it as maybe something that gets away in the way of our plans on the weekend, and that shouldn't be the attitude at all but rather value what God has done, that he has chosen his people before the foundation of the earth, even Isaiah 46, 10, that he tells us before the beginning, he already had seen the end. So Jesus entrusted his church to the most unlikely band of people, even to an unlikely band of disciples whom he defended, prayed for, prepared to spread the gospel through. And today Jesus remains in loyal intercession for us still, according to Romans chapter 8. And although we may make many blunders and are weak and foolish, Jesus, the architect of the church, knows his structure is destined for greatness when he returns. We see in 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are the temple of God? and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Do you not know? This phrase appears 10 times in 1 Corinthians. It serves as a common literary device to pose a rhetorical question, something his leaders should know, that, that his listeners should know, and they don't. That all of these who have been positioned and appointed in the church, they often fail to understand that we, the body of Christ, are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in us, not in the brick, but in his people. This is something that ought to have been a matter of, of common knowledge, but they'd either forgotten it or rejected it or simply taken their eyes off the prize. And their identity of who they are is God's chosen and appointed people. So this phrase is the equivalent of, of what we might say today of, come now, exclamation point. So in this context, Paul is talking about both the church which is the unified body of believers, and the individual Christian. Yes, he's, he's addressing both simultaneously. How do we know this? Well, number one, the context has been about the church throughout chapter 3, and Paul will address our body being the temple of the Holy Spirit later in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. So not only does the context support the view that Paul is speaking of the local church in addition to the individual's the grammar does as well. So the word you in this verse is plural in the Greek. So in the English, the word you is ambiguous. One cannot always tell whether it's a singular you or a plural you uh, for, because both are spelled the same way. But people from the South, of course, have removed that ambiguity and they say y'all. <laughs> Isn't that right? You know, those of you who are from the South, you know what I'm talking about. So here in 316, we could almost read it from Paul's Greek of adding the word y'all in here. He could almost say, do y'all not know that y'all are a temple singular of God and the spirit of God dwells in y'all. <laughs> okay. So clearly y'all all, the passage before us has a dual function as addressing the person and the congregation. And Paul states that the local church is a temple of God. And the two primary words for the temple in the Greek New Testament was hieron and naos. And hieron signifies the entire temple, including the outer courtyard, which even Gentiles could enter. But the other word, naos, denotes just the sanctuary, also known as the Holy of Holies, which could not be entered by the Gentiles or sinful Israelites or anyone for that matter, except the high priest, and him only once a year on the Day of Atonement. So the word temple, naos here, is the, is the, this particular word has great significance. So Paul is saying that the group of believers at Corinth who also is what we speak to us today as the church, that we constitute the sanctuary of God. We are the holy of holies. Okay, it's not about the brick. It's about we, the people, God's people. We are the temple of God, and God himself has called, called us holy and significant, and the Holy Spirit dwells in the church. So let's look at what Paul will say here in verse 19 of, of chapter 6. So we'll get to later just to gain a little more personal application on this. We see, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not of your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So think about it. If you're a temple and I'm a temple, and we're all parts of the temple where God himself dwells, then we all come together under one roof. That means there's a lot of the Holy Spirit in the same place. Therefore, we should absolutely expect God to be in our midst in an awesome way. The indwelling spirit within us 
symbolized by the Ark of the Covenant. That means if one Ark of the Covenant could bring down idols, evoke fear into the hearts of the enemies of God, according to Joshua 3, 6, and 10, and 1 Samuel 5 to 6, then imagine a room filled with hundreds of the Arks of the Covenant. I, yeah, that's what you're supposed to see when you walk into your church. It's a gathering of God's body, his people together. I don't ever want you to see church the same way again when you examine this kind of text. So, but tragically, many the Corinthian Christians and Christians today dismiss the importance of the local church when it's, it's really an assembly of the greatest power on the face of the earth, the presence of God in his followers. So I implore you, Commit to attend church every Sunday. I mean, unless you're absolutely sick, do everything you can to get in the presence of other believers. That's how serious this is. So we're going to pause there. I would encourage you to go back to Hebrews as well on that, to not forsake the assembly of the brethren, especially as the day draws closer. We're to encourage each other. We're to gather together. That's not a suggestion. That's a command because what we've done is we failed to see how beautiful the church is from God's perspective. So I hope that as you hear these kind of words, maybe you're on your way to church. Uh, maybe you go to a Saturday church or a Sunday church. Maybe you're listening to these words right now and you didn't have your proper perspective on. You saw it as an inconvenience. You saw it as something perhaps getting in the way of your other schedule. And now I believe, I hope, I pray that you see your church totally differently. That what you see around you are, are, is the body of Christ at work. And it's something beautiful, and it's something to praise God over, that you are around other believers who believe also that Jesus Christ is Lord, and you're going to worship God the Father with them forever and ever. Let's do it right now, and let's give him a sweet aroma of praise unto his nostrils. Why hold it back? Give it to him now. Praise him now. Even in your car, it's okay. Just say, I praise you, Lord. I got goosebumps running down my sleeves right now on my arms, just praising you, of just getting excited to praise Almighty God. I hope this has been encouraging to you. We didn't get quite get to verse 17 today, but we'll pick that up next week. So I hope you're encouraged through this study. Again, pick it up. Go back and re-listen to the other broadcasts as well as our sermon series. You can go to calvaryfountain.com for that. Listen to the podcast, listen to the radio broadcast, and also be sure to pick up the sermon notes and do a study of your own on this. Lead others in a study. It's God's Word. Use it to His glory. And I also want to encourage you, we have a wonderful craft fair coming up on October 19th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., and all of the proceeds from those tables go to helping ministry as we serve the community. So it's a great worthwhile cause and I want you to be encouraged if you're looking to sell items you can get in touch with us at calvaryfountain.com if you want to just to attend a, a great uh, fundraiser event and, and pick up some items for Christmas you can do that too again October 19th from 9am to 3pm you can learn more at calvaryfountain.com God bless you my friends we'll see you next week